there's this Politico article. Okay, yes. Uh, there's, I have a new hero. Um, I hesitate to, I hesitated to, to talk about this just because I haven't read it yet, but I've only heard. It's a longer thing, and I, but I've skimmed some of the relevant portions, but uh, the drug field protest in Diane Feinstein's office you haven't heard about. Tales of a workplace woe from the underside of... <sighs> nation's capital. I don't know. Have you, have any of you heard about this story, Binder or Brandon? I haven't heard about this one specifically. I don't think. Did it come out this morning? Yeah. So, uh, Jamarcus Purley's staff, uh, this guy who, uh, it came out today. Yes. Uh, very, uh, this is where the anecdote of her confusing Raphael Warnock and Tim Scott came from. Oh, it, it, I, I, I haven't sk- got that paragraph, but this is an interesting one. Things had come to a head two weeks earlier on a phone call with other members of the office. Pearlie had let loose airing concerns of what felt like 10 minutes. He talked about the coworkers who had touched his hair while he sat at his desk, how the senator hadn't even learned his name or spoken to him despite five years of service to her. Oh. So this is, by the way, Feinstein's former chief of staff at this point. Um, not really? chief of staff, um, staffer. Staffer, um, sorry. Uh, I believe, right? Yeah. Just on the staff, yeah. Um, uh, how, are, how the chief of staff seemed to be operating as a shadow senator since the actual one was, in his opinion, no longer mentally there. Um, and then she said she cared more about her do- um, dog Kirby than she does about black people. Apparently, um, uh, uh, after he finished speaking, Pearlie said there was silence. Pearlie knew that he, there, that he wasn't long for the job. He ordered uh, mushrooms later that day. Oh, my God. Now, emboldened by Silas Seidman, he walked through the door into Feinstein's darkened office. He act, his presence tripped the motion-activated lights. His heart rate quickened, but no one came. Uh, he had planned a film where he would just recite the injustices uh, he'd seen and uh, felt while working on the Senate, but on the walk over to the Capitol, he changed his plan. Instead of using his voice, he would simply put on music and smoke a joint <laughs> while I looked directly in the camera. And this is maybe where the psilocybin is overpowering and his yeah, best yeah. laid plans. <laughs> I think maybe a statement probably would have been better. Uh, but he believed his gesture would prove, uh, would work uh, like a piece of protest art grabbing people. Basically, if you want to scroll down a little bit, um, he uh, smokes a joint in uh, Feinstein's office. So did he resign? Uh, that's yes, a, he did. Yeah, he, he resigned. He resigned, yes. And uh, there's, scroll down, Bradley. Um, there you go. And I'll just say that is, that is what every single one of Diane Feinstein's staff should be doing. Um, Absolutely. Resigning. Yeah. But that's like the key point is like the, in the terms is like, I mean, this story, people are going to focus on the mushrooms or whatever, but um, I would say that it operated medicinally there and offered <laughs> the guy a little bit of clarity. Uh, and like that the point about the chief of staff should not be a shadow senator that yeah. is not who people elected in california to be a senator yeah so to I'm, be to be clear she, she technically fired him which i guess probably smart on his part do whatever you can to get fired so then he could uh file for unemployment i guess maybe i don't go, know yeah. <laughs> well i mean what we need to be normalizing in this situation i know people were like very upset at Ken Klippenstein for posting the staffers on Twitter. I didn't agree with posting their salaries. I actually think it undercut it a little bit. Yeah. If I were to tweak it with Ken, because they're not getting paid that much. Especially for DC or San Francisco. Yeah, but I do think that we need to start shaming some of these staffers who are enabling this charade right now. They're trying to remain in power and being public authority. Yeah, being the staff for the number two on the Judiciary Committee, a very senior senator, works out well for them. But like, I mean, in the United States, we need a better culture of resignations based on principle. Yes. Yes. Well, no, I think we have the opposite. I think in the country, we try to make, you know, I guess, quote unquote, the problem. So you think I know what, what you're talking about. And people seem to be able to agree that Diane Feinstein was a problem, both politically and also just like, you know, her health has become an uh, impediment to her doing her job. Uh, but what we seem to have been slowly ebbing away at, and you see it all throughout the political media establishment, is that there seems to only be blame for the single most important person in any structure or institution that is performing negatively. You know, people who write for the New York Times don't want to be blamed for the larger structural issues at the New York Times. They don't want to be blamed for that. They just want to take all of the benefit from working in these roles. They want to put that they worked for Diane Feinstein on their resume. They want to benefit from that clout. You know, maybe they don't make enough money. They make more money than some people. A lot of people in this country do. So I think it does resonate with some people how much they make to be objectively, if not in the political sense, 
personally, I think a lot of people see that they're doing the wrong thing. You know, ultimately, I think that enough people see that they're doing the wrong thing. Enough people understand that the staffers and many staffers like them historically and contemporaneously, and then also many other people who operate in the political media establishment as just a cog in a wheel are trying to further their own careers at the detriment of many other people. And there just has to be some kind of blame that is, you know, m- maybe not as much as Diane Feinstein or some of the higher paid members or higher uh, level members of our political establishment. But, you know, it just has to be untenable or, you know, at least morally damaging to take a job at a place that, you know, is contributing to the overall degradation of our society. You know, people just want to tell you that they're not responsible for the larger the larger issues at stake in their institutional roles. But I think that only really fits for people outside of the political and media establishment, because we are expecting people in politics and people in critical media to be a little bit more reflexive, a little bit more, you know, I think dynamic in the way they consider their roles in these organizations. And like, oh yeah, you know, I write to, I write political news for an audience of millions or hundreds of thousands, but I'm just the cog in the wheel, I think just falls, you know, on deaf ears. Same with like, oh yeah, I'm just the head staff for, for, you know, one of the most powerful representatives in the country, but I'm just a cog in a wheel who's trying to become a bigger cog in a bigger wheel. But forget that, you know, yeah, how and, far does it go the, up? The article says they knew that her mental faculties are degrading rapidly, essentially. That is part of what they understood. I mean, the staffers understand that her chief of staff was acting as a shadow senator. And I just I sent these images of her. We got to put we just got to show this. It's these are this is what happened yesterday she came into the senate first of all she wasn't here for the first judiciary vote today so they made this huge spectacle of it the idea that chuck schumer thinks that standing by her i don't think we have the picture of of them standing together here but like coming in with her um on and and showing uh oh she's back baby she's here as Schumer's here, standing here with her. I mean, guys, like, I feel horrible, horrible. I hope she's not in any pain. But she doesn't look But she look looks well. horrible. She, she looks, is not well. She's in a wheelchair. She looks, she, every report seems that she looks frailer and, like, weaker than she did before. And this is no comment. Like, none of this is malicious when I'm saying this. I'm just saying she's a... She's about to be a 90-year-old woman who has who has suffered from a clear, like, bad case of shingles and also, by all accounts, is in some level of cognitive decline. Absolutely. By all accounts. By like, all accounts, by her problem. staff's accounts, by everybody's accounts. She represents a state of 40 million people. And Chuck Schumer <laughs> thinks, like, no, it's not good politics to to kind of maybe push her out and get some new blood in here. It's better politics to stand beside her and walking with her, like, oh, the triumphant return of Diane, as if anyone cares really does any voter care besides like a narrow true blue democrat go ahead uh defense you- contractors care, I, I, ahead, I, 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 I listen cares. Well, no, no, we, you start don't care. with, we start with Diane Feinstein and then what's next people are going to call for Nancy Pelosi's resi- <laughs> resign I refuse I refuse <laughs> yes you you are worried about the knock-on effects for your girl Nance but I mean like I, she is resigning though Nancy Pelosi's actually doing something a little bit more admirable than what we're seeing here with Feinstein it's it's honestly the Senate brain disease it's Senate comedy disease no one gives a shit about like Oh, her! Uh, we missed you, Diane. They care about. Are we going to have a, a, abortion a judges that are going to protect abortion actually get pushed through? Are we going to have a meaningful hearing on Clarence Thomas's impropriety? Let's go, buddy. I think there's a certain branch of not just Democratic voter, but American that likes the idea of what this represents, that like you can become so important to some institution that, you know, you're just kept around at as like a figurehead. It's about like power. It's about control. Some people are able to very individual easily, glory. Yeah, individual. I, I, glory don't, I, is, I, honestly, I honestly think it's even simpler. I think the, these politicians just develop a straight up fan base around them. Like these are like parasocial relationships. I don't even think well, yeah. there's anything deeper than that um some of these democratic uh true blue diehard voters uh seriously vote for people not policies and and, and that's what we're hearing i mean ruth bader ginsburg we, we've been through this right. before i mean and, and but like the uh, but her the cult of personality around her was a little bit more 
I mean, by the way, like we go, you go in the Brooklyn uh, Mall there, like where where the Trader Joe's and the Target is. There's a big statue of her there. But regardless, um, oh, like God. yeah, um, the like she she at least the, the cult of personality there I felt was a little bit more. Um, acute i just don't know if there is this massive constituency that loves diane well no but they have to say that because if they said the real reason which is that defense contractors need her in there um and like the chief of staff has important votes that he promised them like you know that's not politics right so they have to say like this is about you know making sure you know she has dignity and we need to be you know be sympathetic in this moment no it's because you that like there are v- powerful interests that want her to continue to be propped up and wheeled out and to make votes like that to the extent that she can. Or to, I mean, or they don't mind those powerful interests, the same ones that put her there, don't mind about the judges, don't mind about all the business that isn't being done because they don't give a shit about that stuff. Yeah, no, I think that, you know, the idea of personal professional ambition in this country, you know, unless it's like the literal worst job you can imagine, like, you know, you're just applying to be Hitler, I guess, you know, people will excuse a lot of, you know, personal ambition at the expense of large swaths of the population. People will say that, you know, Kamala Harris had to jail all those people because how was she going to get to a position that she needed to be in? Nancy Pelosi has to be in office because, you know, people have a right to just shameless self-promotion. And I think that's also why, like, the staffers get a pass because, you know, they're trying to shamelessly self-promote themselves within this industry. And, you know, a lot of people just feel as though that's a completely reasonable thing to you know, do at the expense of, you know, large parts of the population. I think when it's Democrats, it's a lot easier to pretend like the, you know, the selfless promotion is one to one with getting things done progressively. But that's just, you know, there's nothing that bears that to be true. And only because we're so used to people being so gung ho about that shameless self-promotion, that shameless professional ambition uh, within these spaces, are we able to like imagine that like Ruth Bader Ginsburg or, you know, Nancy Pelosi or Dianne Feinstein simply being in these positions are enough to push these causes forth, even as they argue against that last half of them? Yeah. And I just don't understand, though. I mean, you, what you're saying is on point, Brandon. It's just the fact that, like, in this country, we need to have more of a culture of what it means to be a public servant as opposed oh, yeah. to a careerist. Yeah. Like, I mean, I don't want the same kind of analysis that you're describing being applied to staffers and people who are literally supposed to be Democratic representatives of their constituents. At, like, that could be applied to, say, if you want to move up as an executive at Walmart or something like that. I mean, that's that's it's part of the financialization of our politics to a degree, those incentives being uh, laid bare. But it's also just deeply disturbing. Um, I can't believe you would judge these people for, <laughs> for just for their decisions. I hate women. I guess that's it. I mean, honestly, he didn't didn't even like do anything except post to who worked for her. I mean, you mentioned the the salary, but that's not even like a contactable detail, though. Like, it's not like he was sending harassment towards them and like directly saying how you could contact them. People should know the staffers who work. I mean, they they do if they want to look it up. It's actually usually listed right on their website. Yeah, this is not hidden. Um, I think that should be known. I mean, if we if this wasn't information to be known, then there would be a lot of reporting on our end that would be lost in terms of like when Republicans hire like far right wing activists to be their staffers. Like this is important stuff that we should know. We should know who our public officials hire. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think that your point is, you know, true, Emma, that like listing their salaries, if it includes anything, is that the salaries don't matter because they're doing it for power. You know, this Mm -hmm. is a job that you have in order to get closer to power, like whether or not you're paid well, there are benefits that, you know, are not quantifiable with the salary specifically. And, you know, you can argue that the power they want is for good reasons, but that's only to justify, well, this is not being done out of like selflessness, other than like, you might believe you'll wield power more selflessly than, you know, the next person like, but there's no evidence of that because they don't do anything positive.